My colleague, Van Ferris, called the fall of Lehman Brothers five months in advance. He called the Bitcoin crash. He even called the top of the NASDAQ to the day. And now, tomorrow, Dan is stepping forward with his biggest and quite frankly, scariest prediction to date. Warning that a massive market event nobody sees coming will surprise most investors and ruin the retirements of millions of Americans. If you don't fully understand what's happening, every dollar you spent your life earning, saving, and investing could be wiped out in the coming weeks. And according to his research, it might never recover. If you're a regular viewer, you know I'm way more bullish, but that doesn't mean Dan's message is something you should ignore, which is why tomorrow I know I'll be tuned in as Dan reveals the details of his big prediction, along with the name of two major companies you likely own, which he warns you should sell immediately. Best of all, he's sharing all of this with you 100% free. For more details and to sign up for this important event, simply go to MeltdownWarning2022.com. Again, that's MeltdownWarning2022.com. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's October 18th, 2022. We got a great show coming up for you. We're going to talk about this little bit of the market rally that we're having this week. Does it have legs? And if it does, how far can it go? And why I think it could have some legs, not very big ones, but I think we can see some more buying because there's a lot of sediment indicators out there right now that are so damn negative that I think it's time for a little bit of bounce. That and more coming up right now on Making Money. Once again, welcome to Making Money. Thanks for joining me. I'm Matt McCall. It's the 18th of October, 2022. And as I can say most days, uh, another beautiful day down here in South Florida. It is uh, a little bit of rain yesterday, but the sun is back out shining. And I went to get a uh, tea this morning around 6.30 a.m. from Starbucks. And I heard all the old timers in there talking about the cold wave that's coming through. Not the heat wave, the cold wave. It's going to be only a high of the 70s tomorrow. So looking forward to that. That's going to be my fall, I guess. But don't forget, I'm going to be in Boston all next week for our annual Stansberry Conference, and you can always come join us there uh, or sign up for the live stream and watch us as well. Uh, sit there in your comfort of your own couch and watch all the great speakers and all the great analysts at Stansberry uh, for three straight days, uh, talking stocks, talking markets, and sharing tons of ideas. So that's next week as well. But let's jump into these markets. Uh, as I mentioned, we are having a bit of a rally here uh, in the last couple of days. And again, when I say rally, folks, I'm not saying that the, we're having this big bull market on, you know, turning around. However, going back to last week, when we had the uh, economic numbers come out, we did trade down to a new two-year low in the S&P 500. We turned around that session, that day, that was on Thursday, ended up closing up for the day. Then Friday came, of course. Fridays have been ugly for most of this year, and that typically happens during a bear market because people don't want to hold into the weekend for whatever news may come out. So we had a really ugly day on Friday. Monday, rallied again into the close. This morning, we opened up. We now have the S&P up about 35 minutes into trading. We're up about 1.8%. We're trading at the best level in, in nearly two weeks. So we're having a very volatile month of October so far. We're having multi-week highs, but we're also having multi-year lows all in the same breath. So this a lot of times indicates that there could be a change in the direction that we're seeing right now because we're seeing big money come both ways. Could it be that we're setting up for the next big wave down? When I say big wave, 10, 12%. Or could we be setting up for a big wave higher, 10 to 12% higher? There's a few things I'm going to show you here. And these are charts um, that kind of take a deeper look into the market and sediment, insider you know, moves that are going on. The first one I want to show you here, this is the uh, relative put buying for retail traders. Now, there's a difference between retail and in institutional traders. Retail traders are you and I. Institutional traders are the huge hedge funds, the big um, uh, hedge funds, mutual funds, the big money moving around. These are the individual investors, if you will, they're called retail. And what this chart here shows you is I circled them for you. It shows when there's a spike in buying of puts. When you buy a put, you're betting that whatever you're buying that put on, this is the puts on the S&P 500, so the market, you're betting that the market's going to go lower. Or you're buying them as what we call a hedge, also can be called insurance, against the portfolio that is heavily invested, that if the market pulls back, again, 
you hedge against the market pulling back. Any way you slice it, if you're buying a put, you're bearish on the market at that time. So let's go back here. This is 2008, 2009, right towards the end of 08, beginning of 09. Big spike in put buy. We know that a few months later, March 09, March 9, 09, I believe it was actually, when the S&P bottomed out and created one of the nicest rallies we've seen in many, many years. The same thing happened uh, 2016, towards the end of 2016. And I'll show you what the market did at that time as well. It was setting up for a big rally. People were buying puts near the bottom. And again, look at this. This now we're looking at at a level. I put a star in this because it is very important to see. This is a level where there's three to one put buying over call buying. Call buying is the exact opposite. If you're buying a call, you're bullish on the market. So it outweighs it three to one. And many times down here, you'll see it's way less than one, meaning there's more people buying bullish options because they're bullish on the market. This is a major spike. And folks, this is going back to 2000. So we had the 2000 uh, you know, tech bubble. Yeah, it got pretty high, but not nearly as high as it is. And again, we mentioned great financial crisis and then 2016, early 2017-ish. And then again, right now, of course, we had right here as well. This was a spike with COVID. And then what we're seeing here right now. So let me go back and show you where the stock market was at that time. And I'll pull up the S&P 500 and break this down for you. As you can see here, this 2016, 2017 timeframe, all through 2015, the market was flat after a nice rally after the great financial crisis. And we went flat and we actually pulled back and uh, hit nearly a year low in that 2016 level when people were buying puts down here. And look what happened to the market after that. Uh, we go back, obviously, here, late 08, early 09. Again, put buying spiked down here. What happened in the market? Big rally after that. And look where we are here again. Spiking right here after, obviously, we know a major pullback, about 25 26% down at the low here in the S&P 500. And again, could we be setting up for yet another rally from there? This is one indicator. So I'm not saying one indicator makes the market, but... When we see this type of action, uh, there typically is something else going on under the hood. Another one that I've talked about several times, and this is, again, a measure of sentiment. And this is the bull bear spread on the AAII Investor Sentiment Survey. And that's the American Association of Individual Investors. Again, retail investors. They ask investors if they're bullish, bearish, or neutral on the next six months in the stock market. So they take the number of bulls and they minus out the bears. So if there's more bulls, it's going to be above zero, more bears below zero. And this goes back to uh, the late 1980s. See, there's been a few spikes down. And these spikes mean the bears are extremely strong. One happened in early 1990, 91-ish. And if you don't know what happened then, uh, we had a big bear, or sorry, bull market from 82 to 90. Then we had a little bit of a slowdown in 90, nearly went into a bear market. It was down about 19.5%, the S&P 500, right here. And of course, that ended up being one of the greatest buying opportunities because the next decade was the greatest, especially for tech stocks in the history of the U.S. stock market. We fast forward up here. We all know what this is. Again, 08, 09, great financial crisis. Didn't time it to the day. This didn't time it to the day either. But it gives you an idea that there's, we're in a sweet spot now that we could be setting up for a big rally. And again, look where we are. We're now flirting with very similar levels to where we were even more bears than we saw right here. And that was during uh, the obviously the COVID induced panic that we had in 2022. So we're seeing all types of um, underlying sentiment really rip into the market right now. And um, it's, it's, it's kind of mind blowing that there's some other things that are going on too. You know, a lot of companies when they report earnings and we're in the heart of earnings season right now, a lot of financials have come out recently and some pretty good numbers. Uh, but last week, FedEx came out and they said that they are going to withdraw their earnings guidance. Typically, when companies report earnings, it's for the past quarter and they, they give guidance for the current quarter and a lot of times for the next year looking out. So they said they're going to withdraw guidance for earnings. So first time they're not going to give earnings guidance in 50 years. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. You know, I'm sorry, first time since March 18th, they also did in 2020. Uh, and then market actually bottomed three days later, the last time they did. So it's the second time in 50 years that they're doing this. First time was March 18th, 2020. Now they're doing it again. Companies tend to get scared and companies are run by human beings. So they're emotional as well. They, they, they have to really 
take a look at their shareholders and do what's best for them. But sometimes they get emotional. And instead of coming out and trying to guess what's going on, they'll just re- pull back guidance and say, well, we, we kind of don't know. And because they are humans and making emotional decisions, when they make that emotional decision, withdrawal guidance, we've seen in the past, typically when you see companies do that, you could be close again to a long-term buying opportunity. We also have this CNN fear and greed index sitting at fear. It was extreme fear last week. We've been below the fear to extreme fear level for many, many weeks now. Again, that's individual investors that it, that it, that it uh, surveys that right now are scared of the stock market, scared of where the economy is going right now. Um, so this isn't something right now that we're seeing that is kind of just coming out of nowhere. We are seeing a lot of people becoming extremely bearish. I got another really cool chart here that I came across this morning, and this looks at the S&P 500 during midterm election years. There's a seasonal pattern to this. Let me show you this. This is a kind of a choppy, ugly looking chart, but I'm going to break it down for you. So the blue line here, this is all midterm years. So obviously the second year, it could be, you know, the second time a president, the second uh, presidential um, cycle uh, or um, uh, second time he's been, he's been elected. I'm saying he because he's only been male so far or the first time. Um, and then you come down here. Uh, this is when there's a Democratic president midterm. The green one, though, is a first year midterm. And that's what kind of jumps out at me. So typically, the market at this point is down when a president that's of the Democratic Party uh, is in a midterm election and when it's in the first of all presidents, typically down. But look what happens when we get into November, because we know the elections are the first week or first Tuesday of November. Boom, we, we rally into it, which we're kind of doing right now. And then from there, the market moves higher. So we had Ryan Dietrich on of Carson Group last week, who's one of the great uh, statisticians out there from our market history. He talked about this, the seasonality, that typically a midterm election year is rough anyway between the start of the year until the election. Again, first Tuesday of November, which is right around the corner. You throw in everything that's going on with inflation, the, the war in Ukraine, interest rates going up, the Fed trying to figure out what the hell's going on, uh, the post earnings slowdown after the COVID rally, post COVID rally. You add that all together and you throw in the seasonality. And boy, this all kind of makes sense. But again, if you add up the negativity that we have right now in individual investors, that is nearly unprecedented. You combine that with the seasonality we have right now, we could be sitting up for a year end rally. I'm not saying that's the end all be all and then we rally forever from there. We're going to have pullbacks along the way. I don't think this is what we call a V-shaped recovery, which mean, which was COVID recovery was a V-shaped recovery. We came down quick, went up fast. I don't think we're in that. I think it's more of a U-shape with some bounces and, and pullbacks along the way. I think volatility remains for, for the near future. But all that being said, there's a lot of indicators standing up right now that indicate to me that we could be on the precipice of a pretty big damn rally. Uh, coming up here right now uh, in the stock market. So that's where I stand on stocks. You know, I, I still think there's a great sweet spot right now. I think uh, you can be, don't be greedy. I think you could be uh, a little bit opportunistic, let's say, and start buying into some companies that you think will be big winners five years from now. Because as I said, the last couple of weeks, maybe we have 15% more downside on a lot of these stocks that have already pulled back 75%. But if they just get back to break even, it gives you 300% in the upside. And 300 in the upside to 15 in the downside, that's a 20 to 1 reward to risk. I will take that any day in any business. You're not always going to be right, but I'll take that every day. Because if I'm right half the time, I make a lot of money on a 20 to 1. So it's just, it's, you're playing an odds game here, folks. And as, as, a, as a numbers guy, the odds tell me that's a pretty damn good way of investing. And again, this isn't for three months or six months. I'm looking out three, probably five years minimum for a lot of these stocks get back to where they are. But again, where else in the world do you make 300% in the next five years outside the U.S. stock market or global stock market? Not many places. So one thing I want to start doing, and this is a segment that I've been uh, kind of looking into a lot, and I think it's, it's, it's a lot of fun and it's going to educate you and you may come away with an idea after this, is I want to do basically a head-to-head matchup. And I pick two of the most popular, two of the largest semiconductor companies in the world right now. And I'm pitting them against each other. So we're taking AMD and NVIDIA. 
AMD symbols, AMD, advanced micro devices. NVIDIA, the symbols, NVDA. Two companies that I've recommended and owned throughout the years, two companies that I've recommended and owned and made money throughout the years. I uh, don't have any exposure to either one right now in any way. Uh, so for me, this is kind of looking at it at a light for me as well. So I broke them down. First, let's give you a bit of an update of where we are with the semiconductors. As measured by what they call the SOC, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index. Right now, uh, we had the semiconductors hit a multi-year low. Let's take a look at this chart. This is the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index. We hit an intraday uh, multi-year low uh, last week. If I zoom out, I'll give you a better idea of where we're at. You can see we have not been in that level uh, since uh, around this time in 2022 after the rally off that uh, March low uh, that we had after COVID. So we're at a level that really, the, the semiconductor index has, has gotten walled. It was above 4,000, came down to the low 2,000. We're hitting at, sitting at 2,257 right now. So they've gotten hit. So what's the reason for that? Well, a lot of reasons. Some of it has been supply chain issues, not being able to get uh, you know, the um, products needed to build the semiconductors. Some has been a slowdown in demand that we had this huge spike during the COVID shutdown for gaming and other types of uh, um, niche areas that require massive computing power from these semiconductors. Bit of a slowdown there. Uh, PC shipments have really come down. Uh, it just came out recently that uh, the PC shipments in the third quarter um, are expected to decline 19.5% um, year over year. And that's not good, but it's actually even getting worse than it was. The first quarter demand for PCs uh, globally was down 6.8% year over year, then 15% year over year. Now estimated here in the third quarter, 19.5% year over year. So PCs, obviously personal computers, need semiconductors, need chips, they need computing power. So you're seeing those come down. So that's, that's been hitting it as well. And then there's everything that's going on in China. Uh, you know, a lot of chips that are used uh, throughout the world right now, especially for emerging innovative technologies, um, are, you know, high powered uh, um, CPUs, uh, which are um, obviously uh, central processing units. Uh, so that's basically uh, uh, what runs the computer. It's the brains of the computer. So recently the U.S. government came out and said, hey, we don't want you sending over any uh, what they call HPCs, the, the, the high ones, the, the very important high powered PCs over to China. Anything related with artificial intelligence, for the most part, don't be sending that over to China. So those are two of the fastest growing applications for semiconductors and are being restricted right now from being exported to China. So that's that's weighed on it as well. So let's break it down into the two big names here, because this is where we want to look at. Um, let's take a look at the size first. AMD comes in around ninety three point five billion market cap, a big company. NVIDIA is even bigger, just under three hundred billion dollars for NVIDIA. AMDs and NVIDIA are both off heading into today, about 64% from their highs that they hit in late November 2021. Huge, huge pullbacks in less than a year for both of these very large uh, leading names in the semiconductor industry. However, look at the five-year return. Again, it's why I talk about five years. And, and this is after a 64% pullback from the high. Still, over the last five years, AMD is up 309%. NVIDIA is up 143%. So you're still making big money if you hold on to these companies. If I look at a 10-year return, and a lot of people are 10-year investors. They, you may say I'm 60-some years old. You're probably going to live to 90-something. You have 30 more years. So you're going to be invested for at least 10 more years. 10-year return, AMD, right around 2,000%. NVIDIA, 3,870%. So about 39 times your money in 10 years. Think about it. 39 times your money. That $10,000 turns into $390,000. The $100,000 turns into $3.9 These are life-changing numbers, folks, over 10 years. And this is after a 64% pullback for both of these stocks. Now, let's take a look at some of the valuations. For AMD, we have a forward price to earnings ratio of about 14.4. Uh, for NVIDIA, 26.5. So a little bit higher, actually quite a bit higher, I should say. And what I did is I looked at the average PE ratio over the last five years for both companies. For NVIDIA, the average uh, PE ratio is 57.5. So it's, it's, even though it's higher than AMD, well below. AMD's average PE ratio over the last five years, 98.4. We're down to 14.4. 
So trading well below its average. You can see the valuation when you compare it to itself. Price of sales, 3.5 to AMD to its average of 6.8. So again, well below that. NVIDIA, 9.4 price of sales. Again, much higher than AMD, but well below its average of 17 over the last five years. Revenue growth going forward over the next few years. Annual, uh, the average estimate for AMDs, about 12.8% revenue growth annually next couple of years. 15.1 for NVIDIA. Revenue growth, bottom line growth, 29.9% annually for AMD. 25.1 for NVIDIA. So solid numbers all around for both. When we look at a price to book, the price to book for AMD is only 1.6, well below the industry average. Where NVIDIA is above the industry average, it's coming in about 12.4. Industry average is around seven or so. And so if you look at just pure valuations, I tend to lead to AMD, but we have to dive into a little bit further to really come through what's going on. So as I mentioned, there's a CPU market, central processing unit. There's the x86 market, which is a type of CPUs used uh, by most uh, personal computers. And right now, AMD is 35% market share. The rest basically goes to Intel. Uh, NVIDIA is not really in that market. Then there is the GPUs, which is the graphics processing unit. And that I'll explain the difference between CPU and GPU in a second. That's been NVIDIA's really wheelhouse for its entire existence. Right now, AMD has about 20% market share. NVIDIA really has the rest, 79% market share. And I will say this, that AMD is not eating in to that huge market share that NVIDIA has. So it's holding on to it. And at the same time, AMD has doubled its CPU market share versus Intel in the last six years. But again, it cannot seem to gain in the GPU versus NVIDIA. Um, and, you know, majority of AMD's uh, revenue comes from its CPUs that I just mentioned and the GPUs, whereas most of the revenue for NVIDIA comes from its GPUs that are used for everything from gaming to data centers uh, to mining cryptos, uh, artificial intelligence, you name it. So as I mentioned, a CPU is a computer uh, processing unit. It's the brains of a computer. Whereas a graphics processing unit, GPU, it does a little bit more tasks. Uh, it does some 3D rendering tasks, uh, artificial intelligence, 4K video. You're going to see the graphics processing unit be a little bit more powerful for a lot of um, more of the innovative technologies that we're seeing come out. For example, uh, mining Bitcoin and mining cryptos. GPUs are used for that. Uh, for a lot of graphics, gaming. GPUs are used for that. Artificial intelligence, GPUs are really important for that. So I don't want to say CPUs are existing because they're not at all. That's not even, not even close to being true. But GPUs are a little bit different and they tend to be more connected to some of the, uh, uh, the little more innovative uh, sectors in technology right now. So let's go back real quick to that ban from China I, I talked about for, by the U.S. government. So AMD basically came out and said that they're not going to really be hurt by that as of right now. I mean, that could change because who knows what the uh, um, government will do, but so they will not be hurt by that right now. However, NVIDIA, they said they anticipate a $400 million impact, $400 million to its revenue in the current fiscal quarter alone due to these export restrictions. Again, AMD came out, quote unquote, saying they it does not expect a significant impact due to these export restrictions. That being said, China is still an important market for AMD. Uh, sales to China uh, average about 25% in recent years. So a quarter of their sales come from China. But as of now, those um, higher end processing uh, center um, uh, CPUs, GPUs are not being affected uh, in AMD's wheelhouse as of right now. You know, if you take a look at, at, at why kind of NVIDIA's pulled back, um, you know, they had a bit of a post-pandemic slowdown. The two other sectors they do a lot of sales in is gaming. We know a lot of us were locked in our houses, so we're gaming a lot. That, as we got back to real life, weren't gaming as much. We also had crypto mining. And crypto, of course, was doing grand gangbusters. The mining for crypto has slowed down. It's putting a lot of second-hand GPUs in the market, which is hurting some sales from NVIDIA at the same time. What's, what's, I thought it was pretty neat, um, you know, Glassdoor, which rates places to work. You know, people go on there anonymously and talk about uh, their employer. So Glassdoor in 2022 has ranked um, NVIDIA the number one workplace. And it has been a number one workplace eight out of 10 years. 
And you may say, what the hell does that have to do with the stock price? I've worked at different companies. I've owned companies. I've associated with many companies. And when the people are happy at the company, they tend to be a bit more productive and the company tends to do a bit better than its competitors that employees aren't happy. It's pretty simple. Uh, again, when you buy a stock, you're buying shares of a company. And what is a company made up of at the end of the day? Human beings. And if they're happy, production's better and typically performance of that company will be strong. So that is definitely a plus in the category uh, for NVIDIA, 100%. Um, you know, we have what's called gross margins, and that's, that's the amount of money that you're making after you take out how much you're spending for that. So I, I have a chart here I want to pull up that shows um, the, uh, I don't know actually, but I have the, I have the revenue I want to show you. I have the revenue for NVIDIA and AMD, and, and with revenue obviously comes gross margins. And NVIDIA is going to have typically higher gross margins because they sell higher end products. So if you sell higher products, a lot of times the margins, because you can charge more, the margins will be a bit wider. Even though they may cost a little bit more to make, what you're charging is much more, which increases your margins, which increases profitability in the bottom line. But I do want to show you here revenue. And this is going back um, about three years. And the reason I'm showing this is even during the, the pullback that we've had, even though the, the purple line is NVIDIA, revenue growth has slowed over the last quarter we still continue to see for both NVIDIA and AMD over AMD in the orange here, you continue to see revenue go up, even though the stock price has fallen 64% for both of them, revenue continues to hit highs, reach levels never seen. So this, again, is something that a lot of times gets overlooked because we get wrapped up in all the big picture stuff. We get wrapped up in all the negative sentiment in the market on semiconductors for technology, et cetera. But if you look under the hood, these companies' revenue are still growing. Sure, valuations were too high back then. They were back then. I mean, late last year. But they've come down. Again, I talked about levels versus the five-year average. Way below that for all valuation metrics. And again, when I weigh these two companies against themselves, it's, it's, it's tough to pick one because I hate trying to pick one. And I think if you want to gain exposure to large cap semiconductors, I would ignore Intel. You put Intel in that category, I'd ignore them. But I would look at AMD and NVIDIA. So let's look at the charts of both of them. Here's a chart of AMD. I told you it's down 64%. So you can imagine we're looking at a one-year chart here. It looks pretty damn ugly. But if I zoom out, it's going to get a bit of a different story. We had one hell of a run up here from single digits back in 2018 up to over 160. So over 16x in a matter of several years. We've now pulled back. And you look at this and you say, well, could it pull all the way back to 40? I don't know, maybe. But again, if you're buying, let's say, around $58 a share, the pulls back to 40. That's what? That's $18. So that's another, what, 30% or so, about 30% to the downside. If you get back to where you were, you're looking about 3x almost on the upside. So again, you're looking at huge upside to what I think is limited downside. We'll look at NVIDIA. Here's NVIDIA's longer term chart. Almost the exact same darn chart. It was above $340 a share, now down to around $120. But again, way off the lows of 2019 when it was down in the 30s. And here's the one-year chart for NVIDIA, almost really mimicking AMD. So if you were just to look at the charts and not kind of look under the hood like we just did, they both look kind of the same. They both have some great niche products. They both are leaders in what they do. Uh, they both have huge contracts with very large customers globally. So you think, well, what's the difference? The difference for me comes down to, to two things. One, I like, I like NVIDIA's dominance of GPUs, the, the graphic processing units. I, I, I love that aspect of it. However, due to its valuation, I believe AMD is the better play here. Because I think the downside of AMD is much less than NVIDIA. Because if NVIDIA were to pull back to the same levels of valuation where AMD is, and it, it shouldn't because it's going to be valued a little bit differently, but if it gets a little bit closer to that, much more downside for NVIDIA than AMD. I think they both have huge upside. I, both, they, I think they both have 3 to 4x upside in five years. That being said, the downside is much lower for AMD which is why, ding, 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 AMD wins this round. And this may change, but in our first head, heads up, 
match mono a mono amd advanced micro devices a 93 billion dollar semiconductor takes down the heavyweight nvidia in a very close match that did go 12 rounds but at the end of the day i would take amd caveat and aside little asterisk i will say i'm a kind of person when i invest i typically buy a basket so if I were to buy a basket of, let's say, semiconductor stocks, it would likely include AMD and NVIDIA and a couple silicon carbide exposure semiconductors, which I've talked about a couple of times. So I would build a basket, but I'm saying right now, if we're looking mano a mano, AMD versus NVIDIA, I'm going to have to go with AMD in our first premier bout. So if you have any stocks you want me to put head to head, Please comment below. I'll do that. You can also reach out on Twitter. It's Matthew McCall. Uh, pretty easy to find that. Put out your head to head you want to see. We'll go through and the best and we'll start pulling those up and doing them every couple of weeks and help you find that next heavyweight champion. Again, folks, thank you so much for watching. We have a great interview coming up on Thursday with Austin Root of Stansbury Asset Management. You don't want to miss that. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great rest of your week. I'm Matt McCall. And that was making money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.